This is the Watchmen Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and this is our feedback episode four. Welcome back, fellow watchers, for our fourth bulletin of the Atomic Watchers, the fourth feedback episode about the series of Watchmen. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. And that's it today, unfortunately. <laughs> I kind of knew this was going to happen at some point over this nine-episode season. We have basically 18 episodes where we're covering the Watchmen with my two colleagues, John and Chris, uh, traveling at the moment. John is over in Switzerland and Chris is over in Colorado at the moment. It's just me this week. But the good thing is, with a feedback episode, it's never just me. It's all of you guys as well, which is great. Thanks so much to everybody who's been sending their feedback. And I'd also like to give a huge thank you to Stuart Campbell, who's supporting us over on Patreon. Thanks so much, Stuart, for going over to the Patreon account over on patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries and supporting us over there. Your support really helps keeping the show going uh, as as we're continuing on after 430 episodes. I think we're somewhere around there at the moment. So it's awesome that people are starting to uh, go over to our Patreon account now. Um, If you want to support us over there, yeah, as I said, go over to patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries. Or, of course, sharing the podcast is a great way to support us as well. If you share it with your friends and your your followers over on your social media accounts, hopefully they'll get to hear our podcast about The Watchmen as well. Surely you'll find some new friends to talk about Watchmen as well. Thanks so much uh, to you, Stuart, and to anybody else that's supporting us on Patreon. Before we get into the feedback, there's just one thing I wanted to comment on from our episode four discussion. Uh, I made a comment about Topher f- seeming very odd in this episode uh, and just keeping an eye on him to see where he's going in future. When I went back and watched the episode afterwards, it was actually just the way the actor was playing the scene and he really played it very well. I just missed a, a note that he was saying in, in the moment. It's basically where Angela is in the bed below him uh, and he's saying that his sisters have taken her bed. Uh, so she's going to share the room with him effectively. Angela asks, are your sisters okay to Topher? And Topher says, well, they didn't see that man getting shot in the head. And Angela says, but you did. So it was, it was actually just that Topher was very standoffish and really scared in this moment. You know, it's a really good discussion between himself and his mom, Angela, to find out whether she was scared in that moment as well, because he's really scared. He seemed to be a much more adult character in the past, I suppose, a, a character that um had a lot of bad things happen to him in the past and he's had to take on the kind of leadership role within his family. Whereas this scene we're seeing, actually, he is just a kid and he is seeing something really, really scary that luckily his kid sisters didn't see. So um, so it's a really good moment. And unfortunately, I just misread the situation or misread the actual uh, intention of the scene when I saw it the first time. So not, not uh, freaked out by Topher. I think I'd be in much worse state uh, if I'd been in that situation. Uh, we just wanted to mention it on our feedback episode. This gives us the opportunity to talk about a difference of opinion that we had in our original coverage of the show and then when we talk about it in the feedback sometimes other things just pop into our heads with that said let's get on to your feedback for this week lots of emails this week i think people were watching the episode a little bit later this week um with veterans day on in the u.s uh, on the 11th of november and um, i think there was a bank holiday so a lot of people may have watched it a little bit later and then sending in their feedback a little bit later to us so um so i've got a bunch of emails uh, first up mac wells sent us in an email to say i am immensely enjoying this program and the world building in the watchman universe I am new to Watchmen, so since starting the series, I went out and got the graphic novel and devoured it. One of you worried on this week's podcast that we will have seven episodes of questions and it all answered in a hurry in the final two hours. I was a big fan of The Leftovers, and it is a well-known fact that Damon Lindelof had clearly stated that he had no intention of answering the main question, where did all those people go? The Leftovers was a landmark moment in TV for me. It seemed to me that in that series, Lindelof presented many mysteries that were never answered, so much so that the theme song they adapted for season two had lyrics... Just let the mystery be. I remember that well. (laughs) Leftovers was not one of the best shows to have ever aired because of its traditional Act 1, Act 2, Act 3 storytelling. Here are the characters, here is their dilemma, here is the resolution. I would caution us to hold very loosely to the expectation for answers. With that being said, I'm afraid where Lindelof may jump the shark on this one is by introducing too many high-attention mysteries that he doesn't intend to answer. But I want to refer back to the novel. As I read through the novel, it seemed to me that it did the very thing that you were worried about, asking questions until the last episode. Each issue continued the mystery, and the whole thing was explained and concluded within basically the final issue, and some in the penultimate issue. I may be alone in this assessment, but it seemed to me that the book waited until the last moments and then quickly answered all the questions. Thanks, Mac. 
Thanks so much for your thoughts on this, Mac. It's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I think you're probably right. The, the comic books, as they were going along, were setting up a mystery for the most part. And that does actually tend to happen even today in comic books when you have a five or six episode series in comics. They do the first four issues are questions and then they wrap it all up in the last issue. Sometimes to the annoyance of, of people that are reading the comic books because it all gets closed off in one issue. I suppose what we're trying to do in our, in our discussion podcast is see if there's any clues to where it could be going in the show. Um, and I suppose by investigating, by talking the way we are about the show, we tend to pick up more questions <laughs> rather than answers. And I think Chris was having a bit of a, a challenge with that in episode four. You know, at this stage, we've done loads and loads of shows. And I think Damon Lindelof is actually a master at storytelling. I think he's really, really interesting to follow along with what he's doing. And he does drop clues to things that are happening in the future that when you look back on them, you go, oh, that was a clue to where our ending is. But he also drops loads of red herrings throughout his shows, as you're probably aware after watching Leftovers. Loads of interesting ideas that are put out there and you can speculate on them. And then it turns out they went absolutely nowhere. Um, he does that a lot because he likes to have a bit of fun with the with the whole concept. What was interesting, if you heard his interview on the official uh, Watchmen podcast, uh, he did mention that each of the writers came in after reading an issue of the comic book uh, that they were assigned effectively and they were trying to follow the sim similar structure to the comic book. So you may be right that this is their intention, that they will have eight episodes of build up of world building as you say and then the final episode is where they reveal the answers to everything you've questioned at the beginning i know damon lindelof also said in another interview that he had to answer a lot of questions from his writing staff that they were grilling him about the fact that they didn't want to work on a show where everybody was hating the fact that the answers they gave were really bad things like that so it's possible that, that he's going to kind of mix those two things that he will reveal some big moments he's already revealed one or two uh, early on in the season but he will reveal big things like names and characters and, and what's going to happen to them or what where they come from he's going to start revealing those as we go through i know next week's episode episode five there is a flashback um or a story about one of the main characters um not going to spoil it right now Obviously, you're going to watch the episode, so I'm not going to spoil anything about it. But uh, I know there is that kind of thing. We're going to get some backstory for some of the characters as we go. But yeah, I agree. Definitely enjoy the ride. Uh, that's always going to be my plan. I'm going to watch till episode nine anyway, because I'm really loving the show, really enjoying it. But podcasting about it, obviously, going to watch till the end. And I really I really enjoy these kind of mystery shows. Loved Leftovers, loved Lost, uh, and really enjoyed those kind of shows. So I'll be here. Don't you worry about it. <laughs> Also an email, Jimbo's back saying, gentlemen, for me, it was always going to be tough to match the highs of last week's episode. And like Chris, I feel my final opinion of episode four is likely to really depend on the next few episodes. This was very dialogue heavy to an almost Kevin Smith level. I'll bet the exposition was done in some interesting ways, particularly through Adrian's fishing trip. Cal's speech about death and the Laurie Angela PT car ride. Loved that car ride. Thought it was hilarious. Jimbo says, Lady T's intro at the Smallville-looking farm was also fun, although, dare I say, it's slightly tropey with the timer and the last-minute sign-off. I have to assume she will be part of the big bad. Has a trillionaire ever been a goodie? <laughs> so at least she has a cool-looking lair for a showdown at some point. How did she get so much money, presumably in a relatively short time, since resettling after the Vietnam War? Regardless, I am sure there is more to her and would not be surprised to find some hidden fighting skills to reveal later. After my earlier feedback, there was yet another obsession with eggs in this episode, which I did not get, but you mentioned that this has something to do with cloning really got to me, and I do now think that they are to, are to be related, possibly taken even further if the pills Will is taking are somehow having some sort of effect on his ageing. I also still loved the camera trickery in here, some great scenes of transitions, again, such as the waffle maker to gatepost change and the pill bottle fading into the bed shape. Overall, a decent evening's entertainment, but hoping for a few more answers and a lot more Laurie in the next episode. Excellent. Thanks so much for that, Jimbo. Yeah, they do definitely lead into some of the tropes here, you know, and kind of flip them and twist them a little bit. I, I kind of liked that opening uh, as Lady True walks outside and goes, you know, sees the, the uh, something land from space and goes, it's mine because she's bought the land within three minutes. It's like as if they got something on their satellite dish and then ran straight to this farm to buy it. Uh, but I, I think it was just a fun little scene, a fun little play on the idea. In regards to how she got so much money, there is a mention, something to do with everything that she has achieved is in Vite's DNA or from Vite's DNA, something like that, where it, it can have two meanings. Either she's saying that she is following up on projects that Vite worked on, or she stole it, or she is connected to 
Vice in some way that she possibly is a child of or some kind of relationship with uh, with Vice, Adrian Vice. So um, that's definitely going to be something that they'll answer in the future. But she's definitely laying in a, down a few little clues as to who she could be connected with. Uh, camera work in this episode was really, really good as well. And I really like the idea that the pills that Will is taking has some effect on his aging. It, it didn't seem any older in this episode. It's been a day or so since uh, he disappeared. I think just maybe just even a couple of hours since he disappeared. So uh, maybe not on his aging, but maybe on his strength. Uh, potentially that's what's giving him his strength uh, to allow him to have the power uh, or maybe it's giving him his ability to walk uh, obviously as well other things uh, but we'll see a lot more of that in the future thanks so much for your feedback there our final email is from graham he says hey boys my name is graham and i'm a first time writer to your podcast you haven't talked about it in detail and maybe it's less of an overt theme on the other side of the atlantic but i'm a good old boy from texas and i've been curious about how religion and spirituality hints at where the direction of the story may be going specifically with dr manhattan characters consistently refer to manhattan in a vague and sometimes reverent manner not unlike christianity we as the viewers are waiting for the second coming and characters like angela and cal reassure themselves that he could do virtually anything except look like one of us He's on Mars, so why would he have any interest in coming back at all? Laurie's long joke in the phone box almost feels like she's at confession, where a message to God takes 40 seconds to reach him. And in the last episode, Cal calmly tells his daughters that heaven is pretend. We come from nothing and return to it, not unlike the philosophy of a certain watchmaker's son. I have a feeling in the next episode we'll see more examples of how Wade, looking glass, takes comfort in his own existence in this post-squid world, judging by the preview. Either way... Judgment Day feels like it's ramping up this season. What do all of you think? Do you have a different take? Let me know. Good joke, Graham. Thanks for that, Graham. It's a really interesting take. You know, it's something that I don't think about very often. I won't. I don't really connect it back to uh, religious beliefs, uh, particularly because they seem to be kind of speaking through both sides of it. As you say, you have someone like Cal going that heaven doesn't exist to the kids at all. So it's like as if in their world, maybe Manhattan doing what he did and being who he was, the super superpower in the world from the 50s all the way up to now, maybe there's a lot less belief in, particularly in Christianity, something like that. Maybe he's replaced uh, that ideal for a lot of people. Laurie's very careful to underline that she doesn't believe he's anything other than a guy who thinks he's God, basically. Uh, a guy who has the power of what other people would believe as God. Um, for my part, I think this is definitely Damon Lindelof saying everything you know he said before the show began that he wasn't going to make this a political show he wasn't going to make this um a show that was going to push your buttons i actually think he's pushing everybody's buttons <laughs> at the moment i think he's kind of playing in all waters trying to say you know i'm not going to target right-wing people i'm not going to target left-wing people i'm not going to target religious people or people with no faith at all i'm going to target everybody and have, and have them all pick out their ideas so absolutely graham i totally understand why you're seeing in the episodes these references to spirituality and references to to religion within dr manhattan character but i think the characters in the show are telling everybody he's not god he is just a person who went through an awful accident and turned into this massively powerful being he's still just a human who turned into a massively powerful being so i think in the show they're saying that some people are taking him as a godlike character and other characters are saying he's not godlike he's just a human so uh, so i think they're trying to say both sides of the argument allow you to pick which one you think i can't wait because i'm really looking forward to see if we see dr manhattan in this show you know it's four episodes in now five episodes to go intriguing to see if that massive character is going to appear on screen in the future we have all these representations of him all around and he's had such a massive impact on the world surely he's going to appear at some point in the series it may just be in that final episode but i'm intrigued to see how they deal with him as a character when he returns to earth or if he returns to earth in the future thanks so much for getting in contact graham please get in contact again and let us know what you think as the episodes are going on Oh, just a PS from Graham that I just missed there. He said, I might be going mad, but if the details in the show are chosen carefully, the valve on Wade's bunker does look like a hydrogen atom, right? It's not just me, is it? <laughs> I actually went back and had a look at this, Graham. Um, it's basically, there is the turning mechanism outside on Wade's bunker. You're right. Um, I thought the little dot that's on it that would indicate the hydrogen atom, I think I thought that, that was just the handle on the inside. It looks like a, a reasonably standard, but you're absolutely right to be questioning everything. They are paying attention to every single detail in the show without a doubt. So you absolutely could have caught something that I didn't catch uh, exactly right either. But uh, excellent to hear from you. Thanks so much for that, Graham. We also got a voicemail in from Greg Schwab this week. Uh, he recorded it and emailed it to us at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com, just like you can. Or you can go over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com. 
there's a leave voicemail button or send voicemail button uh, on the side of the screen just press that it'll, it'll record you for 90 seconds if you don't like it you can record it again and uh, once you're finished and happy with it uh, it will email it directly to us and we'll use it on the next feedback episode take it away greg hello derek john and chris this is greg uh calling about if you don't like my story write your own uh so just a couple of, of not necessarily notes but uh things regarding what you guys said so one cal i wonder if he is a sort of robot or android or whatever the case is uh he seemed very uh robotic as answering those kids oh is there a heaven nope it's all not not a heaven there's nothing um and then with regard to uh, i think derek said what i you know, we'll be, we remember everything that we need to, or we need to go back and rewatch the entire series again. I'm, I'm 100% going to have to go back and refresh and rewatch the uh, entire series. I, uh, I, I, I read the comic and then finding out things, you know, like who Warshak was and whatnot again. I, I didn't realize a lot of stuff until, again, I went back and, uh, and read the comic again. And like, just like that, I'm going to have to watch the series again all right love the podcast love the show you guys have a good one bye thanks so much for the voicemail greg great to hear from you um is cal an android that's a really interesting question there is definitely something odd about him um and as i say it's just the idea that the two of them met in vietnam and came back to to tulsa specifically in oklahoma uh, i think that's really interesting that you know all of these characters are where they are, you know, and Cal seems to say, you know, I don't like lying to Angela. I don't know whether whether that particular scene with the kids made it sound robotic, but he definitely wanted to shut down the idea that they would say to each other, the two girls, that they would say that their uncle has gone up to heaven. He wants to shut that down instantly. In this house, we don't believe there is a heaven kind of thing, you know. Uh, I don't know what happened to them specifically. Obviously, White Knight was a really bad night for all of them. I don't know whether it was that that turned them against the idea of there being any possibility of, of any afterlife or whether they just have never believed that, you know, as I as I said in, after the previous piece of feedback from Graham there as well, potentially with a character like Dr. Manhattan in this world, maybe there is this idea that some people just went well, if that guy exists, there's definitely no God, you know, um, maybe it's that. And some other people went, maybe he is God and left Christianity behind. Um, Cal's not telling us which of those is his particular opinion, but he is definitely saying there's no heaven after earth and there's no point in you uh, consoling yourself with the idea that he's gone off to heaven because there isn't one. And I, I, I do like, I watched the episode again, I did like that the whole situation is completely diffused when they get some waffles in, you know. Uh, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, but I do think, you know, again, Kyle did provide the belief of people that don't believe in an afterlife, which is you're born, you do everything in your life, you grow up, you do everything, and then you die, and, and that's the end of your life. So make sure you live your life the way uh, the way you want to because you only get one shot at it, you know. That's kind of Cal's attitude, and that's the explanation he's giving. I don't know whether that makes him an Android or not, but it is really interesting that uh, that they've presented it on the show, I suppose. And definitely, as you can hear when I'm talking about this, particularly for the feedback episode, I'm probably somewhere in the region of about five uh, times watching each of the episodes because I watch them a few times to take notes, two or three times usually. Then I watch them afterwards to do the feedback episodes. And then I might might watch them another time. So about four or five times I've watched each of the episodes. But I'm not getting anything massively new. I'm getting some little things that I might have missed on the first or second watch. But definitely going back at the end of the nine-episode series and looking back at these episodes back-to-back, -back, hopefully... It's a good enough series that I'll want to go back again at the end of it, not one of these ones where you get to the end and go, oh, it was just that, was it? Uh, okay. It was all a dream or something. I don't want to watch it again, whatever it may be. But hopefully I'll want to go back because right now, this is one of the best shows I've watched this year. It's really intriguing to me. And, and there's definitely things that I'm missing right now. As you mentioned in the comic book, first time reading that seemed normal second time reading it seemed enjoyable third time reading it you start picking up stuff and then more and more times reading the more stuff you pick up and luckily the first time reading it was good uh because that allowed you to go back and read it again so hopefully the tv show will be the same but i think it is and thanks so much greg i'm glad you're enjoying the podcast let's pop on over to facebook uh, janet flemmer simply says phenomenal <laughs> richard blaze also very simply says truly fascinating i don't think there's more things to say about this episode <laughs> i'm glad there is more things to say richard we got two full episodes after this uh, out of this particular episode of, of watchmen 
And finally, for our feedback section, Cahill Fitzgerald says, Episode 4 was my least favourite, in an 8 out of 10 kind of way. Still essential TV, but there is a line not yet crossed where more characters and more weirdness begins to take away from the core brilliance. For example, in Episode 1, the setup of the police and the 7th Cavalry and the underlying race issues was gripping. Tick-tock, raids on shantytowns and KKK outfits and all that. The introduction of other characters this week, Lady True and the associated weirdness like the Ivy line and her daughter and the sore feet lube man much of this at this point removed from the core plot i will stay with the show because it is the best tv i've seen in many years though there probably is a limit to what you can ask audiences generally to disregard in terms of weirdness i'm confident in the payoff once it all ties together so bring it on and anyway if you don't like the story write your own <laughs> nice one call yeah i think i mentioned that i thought that was a, a title chosen by damon Lindelof to troll people that uh, that were saying this isn't the watchman i wanted <laughs> he's kind of saying yeah just you go write your own story if you didn't like it as for the weirdness uh the Leftovers, I suppose, previous show was 28 episodes, 10 episodes, first two seasons, and eight episodes in the last season. And honestly, you could watch the first six episodes and not know where you're going. And then things start to tie together a little bit about the people themselves. But as also mentioned in feedback earlier on, from Mac, the actual central mystery wasn't solved at all. I don't think that's going to be like that in, in Watchmen. I don't think we're going to have the central mystery not solved but in kind of a Twin Peaks way where you had two seasons where weird stuff was going on and ended off just not mattering, but adding to the foundation and groundwork of the show. That's kind of the way I'm seeing it a little bit. I'm kind of enjoying the weirdness, but as long as it comes back to the central mystery, keep the weirdness in the world. The world's, world is weird places, you know. <laughs> I don't think absolutely everything explained on the show at all. As long as the central idea and the central storyline is dealt with, I'm, I'm fine with them taking these kind of detours. I do think next week's episode is a little bit more centered on the main premise of the show how they got from 1985 to now and what's happened between those two dates and and what's going on in the world now as well i think we're gonna get a lot more explanations or a lot more detail in that hopefully that's a bit more satisfying if you didn't enjoy this kind of side trek uh, in this episode but thanks again Cole, for sending in your your feedback and really good to hear from you every week after after watching the episodes and if you want to join us on our Facebook group, join us at facebook.com slash groups slash TV podcast industries. I do put up a spoiler post every Sunday before the episode airs where you can pop in your thoughts and we'll read them out on the feedback episode later on in the week. Next up, our regular PTpedia section, the HBO website, hbo.com slash PTpedia, where there are some documents up there, usually after each episode to explain some things or kind of add to the world after the episode. There's just two documents after this week's episode, and both kind of a bit more about Laurie and a bit more connected to uh, what happened at the end of episode three, we'll say. The first one's called Interrogation Redactions. So this is a an interrogation interview with uh, Laurie and uh, some members of the FBI, uh, where they've marked out a lot of items that aren't for public viewing. Uh, so there's a lot of elements redacted. But we can still find out a fair bit uh, within this document. It is actually quite funny. You know, you can read it through once and it, there's some funny moments in it. I'll talk about those in a second. But it does give you some really interesting information about Laurie's success in her career, I suppose. Um, the interview begins with her being confirmed as formerly Silk Spectre and the Comedienne was the title that she took on. So it wasn't the Comedian. She did take on Comedienne as her, as her actual name. I don't think we heard that uh, specifically called out in the show. Also, she's in custody because she apparently killed a man referred to as Mr. McVeigh and prevented a terrorist attack. Just in case you don't know, because some people don't get, get all the historical references, particularly if they're from outside of the US, but uh, Mr. McVeigh is most likely Timothy McVeigh, uh, who was an American domestic terrorist. And in 1995, he planted a bomb in Oklahoma City, where uh, where the show is based in Tulsa. Um, the, the, he planted a bomb in Oklahoma City, which killed 168 people and injured 680 other people uh, on American soil by an American terrorist, effectively. In real life, he was captured within 90 minutes of the bombing and after a full investigation, convicted and sentenced to death, and he was killed in 2001 by lethal injection. So interestingly, what we're learning from Laurie is that when she was the comedian and teamed up with uh, Night Owl, both of them had Timothy McVeigh under surveillance and prevented this attack, saving the lives of all of those people. So this is probably one of the big changes here i suppose um by having this universe the way it is seeing that with having vigilantes in their costumes in the world they actually did save the world but i wonder if this partially shows you why larry turned against uh the idea of it because the fbi are after her they want to charge her with murder effectively because she killed a man when actually she can see that everything she's found out says that she prevented a terrorist attack 
still don't know who's writing these in in the real world as well. Uh, this one seems like an odd one for um, Petey to have to have in his files. Um, it's definitely written in the same voice. You can hear Laurie's voice as she's admonishing and giving out to the FBI agents for the kind of crap they're going through with her. I think that's that's quite funny. Um, she talks a little bit about her relationship um, with Dan Dryberg. She says they broke up because he wanted kids and and I wanted guns. Uh, also mentioning that he was the head of a company called Merlin Tech. And that does actually explain that thing we were talking about in episode one. We were wondering why Judd would have been driving and so good at driving the L ship that we saw in episode one. It actually turns out that Merlin Tech created these L ships for the police officers. So probably puts paid to the idea that Judd is actually Dan Dryberg, which was my theory <laughs> at, at episode one. Uh, it probably puts paid to that mice anyway, because uh, everybody seems to have the L ships because they were created by Merlin Tech uh, and they're using them around here. Um, also, interestingly, the FBI in 1995, where they're interviewing um, Silk Spectre or interviewing uh, Laurie, they don't know that Rorschach is dead because they ask her to tell them his whereabouts, but it's all redacted apart from just her line saying sad little redhead with lifts in his shoes. So we know she's still talking about Rorschach. She mentions uh, Dr. Manhattan going off to Mars, but all of this is redacted. But you can get the impression, at least, that the FBI don't know that Rorschach is dead. So that's quite interesting. You know, it could flip towards the Seventh Cavalry thinking that Rorschach is alive or somebody taking on his persona potentially. Um, because if nobody knows he's dead, it could be quite easy for somebody to slide in and take his um, persona potentially. Um, some kind of cult leader sliding in and, and taking on his persona to lead the Seventh Cavalry. That could be a way that this is, but we'll obviously see that in future episodes. Uh, final part of the interrogation, probably, uh, which, is, which was quite interesting, is the agent arriving with the silver case. Uh, Larry explains that Dan made her the dildo of Dr. Manhattan because he thought she was still holding a candle for her ex, which is, wow, what an F you to your girlfriend to say, I think you're thinking about your ex. Here's something to remind you of him. Uh, amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Last thing, at the end of the interrogation, uh, the transcript ends with Laurie saying that she knows what actually happened on 11-2. And to tell your boss's boss's boss that she knows and therefore she will be freed. So that's a reference to the comic book. Uh, the giant interdimensional squid was dropped in New York roughly on that date. Uh, we know the, the first issue started in October and led into November. So is Laurie saying that something different happened to what the world knew happened? Um, is she confirming the theory that's in Rorschach's diary that it was Adrian Veidt that set the whole thing up? Um, is that what's happening? This is back in 1995. We know that Dr. Manhattan's still off planet and we know that Adrian Veidt is in some form of prison. So is this just a reference to around the time when Adrian Veidt was captured? We'll see how that plays out in the episodes. Uh, the other documents in there, almost impossible to explain, but it is blueprints for the Excalibur, the dildo that was created by Merlin Tech. I suppose interesting just to confirm that it is what Larry was saying, I suppose, is completely true. It was created by Merlin Tech, uh, by Dan Dryberg, because the initial and the blueprint is D as well. I just think it's hilarious that they put this together. They actually drew the drawing and created the blueprint and put it up on the website. I think that's really good fun. Uh, I always have lots of fun of this show, though, overall. That's it for the PCpedia section of our podcast and of this week. I'm looking forward to seeing more documents next week. Those ones are a bit more fun, but I think I, I think it, it is still world building within the interrogation, even though it's more a little bit about the comedy of them finding this uh, silver box that's locked at her after there has been this terrorist attack that she stopped um, before it happened, they think she's also got a bomb in this metal case, which I just think is, is kind of a, a bit funny. As always, final part for the episode, the Watchmen pub quiz question for episode four, also written by John. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, he couldn't be here to deliver it. Uh, his question for this week is, what did Mr. and Mrs. Clark get paid for their land by Lady True in episode four of the HBO Watchmen series? See, I kept up his, his formatting as well. Um, after watching the episode a second time, I did realize that Chris was incorrect in our last podcast. But if that's all you can remember is what Chris said they were given, pop that into us and I will accept the answer. But check the episode. It's very early on and you'll find out what Lady True offered them for their land. Um, yeah, please keep sending your entries in. You guys have been really good. been getting great uh, responses in, particularly to the episode three question. <laughs> There's some great uh, descriptions of what everybody saw in that box. Uh, thanks so much for joining me for this episode. We will be back on Monday, the 18th of November for Watchmen episode five, Little Fear of Lightning. Hoping it will be more than just me and hoping Chris at least uh, can join me for that episode. Uh, and we'll be back next week again for more feedback from you, hopefully. Thanks so much. Talk to you then. TikTok. 